Hey, this is Digital Bike Computing. Today we're going to be discussing physical and virtual servers and which server you should be implementing and why. My name is Emilio, I work in the IT industry and I absolutely love it. Today we're talking about physical and virtual servers and why you would choose one over the other. At the end of the day, as a business owner, as somebody in the IT industry, you always want to be keeping costs down while keeping productivity up, making sure that your systems can be recovered as well in the event of a disaster. So they're really the big things that you want to consider when you are considering a physical or a virtual server infrastructure. How much is it going to cost? How it will perform and how secure it will be? And how easy will it be to restore services in the event of a disaster if I need my business to continue functionality as normal? So we are really talking about servers and server infrastructure that is on premise or that is owned by the business or the IT managed provider of a company. Uh, we are, you know, we're not going to talk about things like cloud because you can have servers sitting on the cloud or managed by other. Um, parties, for example, we're really talking about servers that are in-house. They could be in your physical building. They could be in a data center or in a co-location site that is still owned by the business. So we're really focusing on servers, physical and virtual, that are within your business. So this is an example of what a physical server uh, infrastructure would look like. Physical servers have been around for a very long time. Um, in the olden days, there was no really such thing as a virtual server. They were all physical. Every single server that you would have would be a physical server. So a physical server is literally like a computer that has a lot more smarts and a lot more brain power behind it um, and can perform a lot better than your average desktop can. It is physical in the sense that I can physically see it and touch it and actually go in and open it up and do all those sort of things with that physical server. In this case, I've got an example here of four physical servers. One is hosting a domain controller and DNS. The other one is a mail server, perhaps something like Exchange. I've got a file server, which all of my files are sitting on. And I've got a database server, which could be used for multiple databases. Now, this is a standard operating structure for physical servers. You've got a physical server built that has functionality um, within it. So each physical server would have its own function, its own purpose. In some cases, a physical server could have multiple functions. So in some businesses, for example, one physical server could be the domain controller, the DNS, the mail server, and the file server, for example. Um, in most places, you would, de you would generally want to split up those services into multiple servers. Um, otherwise, you're going to be having performance issues and you have to upgrade, you have to have a very, essentially have a very, very powerful server to be able to cope with the, um, with the operations. And the other scenario is if you lose that one server that contains everything, you're in big trouble. So it's always good to look at load balancing your services across multiple servers. All of these servers would have some sort of storage attached to it. The physical servers themselves could have their own storage built in. So this server could have a RAID worth of hard drives built in and all of the data is sitting on that. Uh, same with the mail server, the file server, and the database server. They could have their own built-in storage. Um, in the case of most uh, most larger businesses, you're going to have um, a dedicated storage device attached to it. So this would be a SAN or a NAS, a storage area network or a network attached storage, uh, and that is essentially connected into all of those servers. So these servers may not actually contain most of the data. The data is actually sitting on some sort of a dedicated storage solution. Now, this seems like a very good model, but you've got to consider that this is a high cost model in the sense that I've got to have a physical server for each individual application or each individual service that I'm wanting to provide to the business. Um, if I lose one server, I lose all of those functions on that server, right? If I lose the mail server, I've lost mail. That could be detrimental to the business. The business may not be able to operate unless it has active email systems. Of course, the advantage of having physical servers is that they're physically there, they are dedicated, and I can go in and upgrade them, and they are dedicated for one individual service. But they do fail in the era of redundancy. There is actually no redundancy built in out of the box um, for physical servers. Uh, as well as that, 
thinking about costs, we're, we're talking about things like electricity and physical rack space as well. Um, these servers have to physically sit somewhere. They have to be powered. They have to be cooled by air conditioning units. So if you consider all of those options, um, the cost of physical servers is generally going to be higher than if we say look at the alternative, which would be the virtual server infrastructure. If a server does fail, for example, and I've lost my DC, my domain controller and my DNS, of course I'm gonna have services interrupted, but then I have to organize a replacement server, rebuild it, and if it's running something like Windows Server, I have to reconfigure Windows Server, reconfigure my DC and my DNS, I may have to restore from backups, but I'm essentially rebuilding a server. I have to source that server, I have to reconfigure it, rack it, cable it up, reconfigure all of the applications and the software before it's up and operational. Scalability on a physical server is always gonna be a bit of a challenge. If I need to upgrade the resources, for example, on my mail server that is running 32 gig of RAM and I need to upgrade it, I essentially have to power down the server, source the RAM from wherever it may be. I have to wait that amount of time for that RAM to come in. I have to go down to the local IT store and purchase some additional RAM, open it up, put it in, and there you go, right? And then I can bring everything back up um, and I can upgrade it from 32 to 64 gig. But that amount of time, the amount of effort to do that is quite challenging. If I have to upgrade the CPU, I may be stuck. If, if I've got you know 16 cores uh, on two CPUs, and then I need more resources, I need to upgrade or double it to 32, um, you're gonna be in trouble as well. So uh, the scalability of a physical server is a bit of a challenge. Generally, when you buy a physical server, you want to purchase it already with enough resources for intended 12, 24 month, even five years worth of growth, uh, because it is a challenge to look at upgrading those services later on. So if we compare this to a virtual server infrastructure, unlike the physical where I've got multiple servers hosting different operations, different services, I've got in this case a virtual server, I've got one physical server hosting multiple virtual servers. So the physical server in this case could be what's called a hypervisor. There are the big vendors which are your Citrix and your VMware, also Microsoft have their own virtualization technology. Um, essentially, it's a physical server still running a hypervisor operating system. If we're talking about VMware, for example, VMware's hypervisor is called ESXi. You would install ESXi onto this, and then you would go and configure multiple VMs, virtual machines, within that one server. So now, rather than having multiple hard, you know, multiple pieces of hardware, multiple servers here, I've got the one server hosting multiple VMs. Now the great thing about this, is if I do a comparison, let's say I've got the domain controller in the physical environment here, and it has eight gig of RAM, and it has one CPU. If I need to upgrade that, I would have to power those services down, open the box up, procure that you know additional hardware, and install that additional hardware, if I can even upgrade it in the first place. In this scenario, this hardware, this server, has got the resources already built in. So you would go and purchase this hypervisor, this physical server, with enough resources to be able to cater to all of this and then some more intended growth, right? So if my DC now requires more resources, I can literally upgrade the resources on here using physical resources that are sitting on my hypervisor. So I can easily boost up the RAM, the CPU of any of these um, directly using the resources from my hardware, from my hypervisor. So essentially a chunk of RAM, let's say this particular server has 64 gig of RAM, physical 64 gig of RAM, I can allocate components of that, 8, 16, 24, 32 gig of RAM for example, across these virtuals, and it's going to use 32 gig of RAM physical on my physical server. The same with CPU, the CPU can be shared, so I can use the CPU that is on here and share components of it across my virtual servers. Now the thing that's very important is when you are specking up or scoping out your virtual server infrastructure, is you've got to think about capacity, you've got to, be, you've got to think about how you're going to provision those VMs because you can under and over provision VMs. You don't want to essentially create too many VMs in here that this start to run sluggish because what can happen 
is there are, there are operations in place here for sharing CPU resources and usage where if this server here, if this virtual server is hogging up or taking up most of the resources, then the other servers could potentially perform poorly as a result of this server using up most of the resources. So you always have to spec up and allocate the resources accordingly on your physical server across your virtual servers. So straight away, you can see that this is a lower upfront cost model. Rather than me having to purchase four servers, I've just purchased one and I've installed multiple virtual servers on top of it. The maintenance of the server is significantly easier as well because I've got less of them. If I have to go and maintain all of these servers, you know, we're routinely going in and checking them, making sure that they're healthy, renewing the warranties, upgrading the parts, upgrading the firmware, all those sort of things. I've got to do it across all of my physical servers. If I've got, you know, hundreds of them, that could take a long time compared to a hypervisor or a physical server running virtualization technology, I do it essentially on less infrastructure. The only consideration that you need to make is when you're choosing one or the other as well, is um, the compatibility of the applications or the, uh, the programs that are running on that uh, physical server. There are still some um, services that cannot run virtualized. Um, that is changing, it's changing very, very quickly, but just keep that in mind. Now look, I'm gonna say that majority of your core end services are going to be able to be run virtually, so you don't have too much of a consideration there, but do double check if you are running third party applications, party, you know, applications that may be catered just for your business or is not very well known in the industry, consider whether they can actually run on virtual servers as well. Ideally, when you're setting up things like high availability and redundancy, um, you don't wanna have just one physical server here running virtualization technology, because in the case of this, if in the physical world I lost one server, I've lost one server, but other services could still potentially still operate. In this scenario, if I lose this physical server, I lose every one of these virtual servers. So what you do is you'd set up multiple, at least two physical servers, set them up in redundancy so that they have high availability so that services can flick between the two. So I can have a second hypervisor configured. Between them, they're connected. They're what's called highly available, high availability. So there's a technology you can configure so that the two servers know about each other and I can have the servers split across the two. So I can have, for example, I can turn the DC off in here and I could be running it over here. And I can actually split the services, all the VMs between the two servers. In the event of a disaster and a physical server dies, let's say that server died, right? All of these VMs could be spun up over here. So in this scenario, I lose a server. I'm in big trouble, I can't really get anything up unless I restore it. I have to build a new server, potentially restore the software, restore the backups. Um, in this scenario, I lose a server, I can have everything just spinning up and running on this secondary server right here. If we're talking about much bigger picture, um, if, you lose, if you lost both of them, if they're both located say, in the same data center, in the same comms room, you could set up multiple servers across other locations and then have them replicated from one site to the other so that in the event of a disaster and your operations do fail, you can easily spin them up in another location. Well, in the olden days, in this physical server infrastructure, unless you've got it configured properly, if you lost your on-premise servers, if you lost your data center, your comms room, your server room, you could lose everything and then to be able to restore everything could be a huge challenge and could have a significant financial cost to the business. So as you can see, really in, in the scheme of things, uh, virtual servers are definitely a better option for, for most businesses. Um, you're thinking about cost effectiveness, performance can be improved because I can easily increase the performance of these VMs quite easily. Um, and disaster recovery is much easier as well because I can have services such as high availability configured so that if services fail on one, they can fail over the other. So the things you've got to consider when you are looking at physical or virtual and comparisons between the two is really you're starting off with the budget, right? You're starting off with how much is it going to cost me? 
how much physical hardware do I need? How much is that gonna cost me in terms of you know, procuring the hardware, setting it up, so maintenance, somebody physically going out and maintaining it and building the server, right? In the scenario of, let's say, of an IT professional, they have to go and source a particular piece of hardware and you either can do it in-house or organize a third party, but you have somebody needs to physically set up the server. In a virtual environment, spinning up a server is considerably easier because it's literally a virtual server that's already sitting on some form of physical server infrastructure. Consider your disaster recovery and business continuity. Uh, in any business, you wanna make sure that services are operational as often as possible, and that in the event of a disaster, in the event of something going wrong, you can restore operations as quickly as possible. Restoring operations in this model is much easier and much more timely. Like you can actually restore things in a much quicker fashion. This model is a bit more challenging. Uh, it can be done effectively if you are willing to put and invest the money and you have you know, full replication set up across multiple physical servers. Virtualized disaster recovery and business continuity is a lot more consistent. So remember that if you lost a server in this environment, uh, that server needs to be rebuilt. In this environment, you lose it. If you've got high availability configured, it just spins up and runs on here and you potentially have no to little outage. A little could be only a few minutes while the server is booting up again. Um, if you lost everything, you're in big trouble. If you lost everything here, you could be, have it replicated over to alternate sites. You lose this, you can spin up everything over here quite easily. So most servers will have some form of backup in place uh, that is actively reviewing those servers and backing them up on a regular basis, whether it could be daily, weekly, or monthly. Those have to then go off to a some sort of a backup media and retain for a certain amount of time, etc. But in the event of a server, physical server dying, I have to restore everything from scratch. It could take a long time. It will take a long time if I have to procure the new hardware and, every, and everything. If I lost a mail server, like, like let's say this is okay, but I've actually lost a virtual server, the restoration of that virtual server is a lot quicker also. In a virtual environment, you can do full snapshots of the VMs themselves. Um, because essentially the VMs are just a big file containing a lot of mini files um, that reside somewhere. So restoring a virtual server is much quicker and more effective than a physical server. Performance is the other consideration. Uh, purchasing some hardware for your physical server, then purchasing a hypervisor and adequately specking out your virtual servers, uh, you can have adequate performance right now. Down the track, as your server requires better performance, or you need to improve the performance, it's more challenging to do that on the physical side than it is on virtual. On virtual, you can just literally spin up that VM and just give it more CPU, more RAM, literally on the fly. In some scenarios, you may not even have to power down that VM to do that. So it is much more um, adequate and much easier and so much simpler to do that in a virtual infrastructure as well. And then let's think down the track. Let's say you need to migrate services uh, you're changing offices, you are uh, acquiring a new business or you've been acquired by a business and you need to migrate services or you're running an older operating system and you need to migrate services from one to a newer operating system, for example. Whatever that scenario may be, migration of virtual servers is considerably easier than migration of a physical server. In the scenario of here, if I need to move servers from one to another, I literally can just move them on the fly from this host to this host. I can procure a new piece of uh, server infrastructure, physical server infrastructure, and set it up here. And if I need to move VMs from here to here, it's literally, once that's all configured, I just right click on it and I can move it on the fly from one to the other. I can't really do that on the physical infrastructure. If you're changing offices, uh, a virtual infrastructure, I literally just pick up that hypervisor, one physical server, or the multiple, that contain my multiple VMs, and I just relocate them. Um, in the physical, there's obviously a lot more. So it's a lot more effort to move things between one site to the other. So that is a overview of physical and virtual. So really in summary, physical, you're gonna to have to have physical pieces of hardware, physical servers running multiple different types of applications. While in the virtual infrastructure, you can literally commission one or more physical servers running hypervisor technology and then have multiple virtual servers running within it. I would love it if you commented 
below as well. Like my video and subscribe to Digital by Computing. I release videos fairly frequently on a weekly basis on a various range of uh, technology types of topics. And I would love it if you commented, let me know what you think, let me know what sort of videos you want me to also write as well. And uh, have a good day and we'll see you next time. So if you found that video helpful, please like it and subscribe to my channel Digital by Computing just on the button there for more videos.